and we do not do our research. Our research is not funded by anyone, but uh, we're just researching on what we think is important. So we are independent. I have two publications here. This is the book describing the work and results of the think tank of last year. It deals with the care economy and also with the paradigm of caring, which is which contradicts the paradigm of of cash and money making. And the other is a publication I wrote myself about the perspective of open socialism. So maybe you'd like to take a look. If you're interested, you can of course also buy the book. Here at the front I also have a text that deals with several questions of growth and environment and so on. This one is for free, so please take a copy if you like after the panel. So I'll now start my topic. In Switzerland, you know that we tend to hold referenda. We have a so-called direct democracy in Switzerland. We are not only a democracy, but we try to have referenda as well. And if people manage to collect 100,000 signatures regarding a certain topic, then there has to be a referendum held on this topic. On the 9th of February of this year, such a referenda took place. It had been launched by the Swiss People's Party, a party that unfortunately got 26% during the last elections. And it's a bit, it, you could compare it maybe with what you have in Germany, the alternative for Germany. It's quite right-wing, nationalistic, and, and uh, racist on the one hand, but neoliberal on the other hand. So they, through the referendum, they demanded to limit migration, to impose contingencies on migration. The initiative does not define what exactly these contingencies should be, but it wants to impose those um, contingencies, which of course stand in stark contrast to the freedom of movement in the EU. And the second part of that initiative was that people of Swiss origin should be given preference when applying for jobs. The Swiss national, the Swiss People's Party, the the SVP was the only party supporting this initiative, and this uh, this initiative was taken on. So people voted yes in the referendum. It's just a a um, very small majority of 50 point something percent. And since, ever since then, we've had a heated debate in Switzerland. So let me tell you, how did we try to fight this initiative before it took place? The association of um, Swiss companies tried to fight this initiative with one main argument. And this argument stated that the initiative endangered the treaties that Switzerland had already signed with the EU regarding freedom of movement and so on. So they said that Switzerland and uh, this initiative did not have the right to um, break the regulations in those treaties. Also, for example, the right for someone who works in a certain country to have his family join him in that country. As you know, Switzerland is not a member of the EU, but if, imagine, Switzerland did not keep up this, this freedom of movement, then you can imagine what would happen to the EU. So the EU really doesn't have room for maneuver here. And um, the businesses took a clear stance against these contingencies because they would harm um, 
they would harm business making in Switzerland. Because from an economic point of view, Switzerland is very much tied to the EU. These bilateral treaties that I was talking about, that for example guaranteed freedom of movement, also deal with the Dublin and Schengen agreements with regard to traffic and trade, which are very much essential for Swiss commerce. So that was the main argument against this initiative. And the people forcing this argument were hoping that people would understand how strong an argument this was, but it didn't work out. Because as you know, a small majority still voted yes in the referendum. As you can see here as well, this reflects one of the degrowth arguments that says excess, excesses do harm the well-being in society. Here you can see the background and how the arguments were presented. From various points of view, it is true that there has been a lot of migration to Switzerland over the last couple of years. More people than those who emigrated from Switzerland. So maybe, for example, 100,000 people immigrated into Switzerland and just 30,000 left Switzerland. So this leaves us with 70,000 more people than before, which at first glance seems like a problem. We'll talk about later whether this really is a problem. So as you will see, the, the advocates of this initiative presented these arguments saying that we have to take on hundreds of thousands of more people every day, 42,000 um, to, be, to be more precise, and they said that this was a problem for Switzerland. There were also some green arguments, arguments from the environmental point of view, that played an important role in the debate. For example, traffic. They said if there's more people, there's more traffic, there's more traffic jams. After analyzing the reasons f for why the world turned out to be how it was, they found out that this is really one of the the main arguments of how the the SVP, the the, the Swiss party, um, tries to present their arguments, they are doing it in a very plain, very 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 simple phrases. However, this vote was not the end of the debate. There will be another referendum on the 29th of November, so in less than three months. This initiative was launched by a group called Ecopop. Ecopop means uh, Ecologie et Population, so environment and population. And this initiative goes even more strongly into the same direction. They are trying to And they are also demanding that 10% of development funding by the Swiss government should be, um, should be attributed to the aspect of um, stopping population growth, so uh, controlling population growth. because they are saying that population growth is not comparable with the limited resources of this planet. Here you can see on, on the one hand the problems that we have and on the other hand the arguments that are being presented. 126,000 people every year are coming to Switzerland and just um, 
just a few <laughs> fewer are leaving Switzerland, so we are left with a saldo of 70,000 more people who stay in Switzerland. The Swiss People's Party, who won the vote in February, has been known for years to be xenophobic. Ecopop, on the other hand, tries to convince people that they are The scores with the politics of the last government. Sustainable research management.
and I'm glad to be able to um, have a debate with you on the pitfalls that we're facing as members of this movement. Now, my talk will focus on population control and population control policies that are um, justified in ecological terms in particular. And I'll also be speaking to the links between this sort of discourse and the discourses of uh, sustainability and post-growth. For decades, there's been a massive critique of um, population control policies that's been formulated, articulated by feminists, um, and that's um, addressed in particular the human rights uh, violations that have been involved in policies uh, seeking to reduce the number, seeking to uh, curb population growth. And what's interesting is that there was a very, very lively debate on this issue in the 1980s and in the 1990s. Um, but since the um, Cairo consensus in the 1994, um, things got a little more quiet. And now there's a revival of um, discourses of uh, population growth and population control. And uh, this uh, debate has been uh, picking up again in movements, uh, in emancipatory political movements. And uh, we have uh, a, a resurgence of approaches that are, can be called neo-Malthusian. And I'll explain what that means in a moment. Um, at present, we have about 7 billion people living on Earth. It, it was um, only 6 billion back in 1990. So the rapid population growth that we've been witnessing is considered a key crisis factor in the in discourse ecological discourses today. And we have a discourse that goes back to nine to the late 1960s when Paul Ehrlich published a book called The Population Bomb. So he um, used this metaphor of population as a bomb that keeps coming up again and again in this discourse. And the Club of Rome report in 1972 was also a text that uh, addressed issues of population growth. Um, population growth was one of the problems addressed in that report as um, a, a, a development or a trend that might lead to various sorts of crisis. Now, um, this leads me to um, the work of the um, British uh, economist Thomas Robert Malthus, who in the late 18th century um, um, engaged with the relationship between um, nutrition and, um, and population. And he wrote effectively the first book on the scarcity of resources um, and its uh, relationship to population growth. And um, it's astounding to see that this, uh, this, um, these Malthusian, I Malthusian ideas keep cropping up um, until this day. His uh, work, Malthus's work, Principles of Population, published in 1798, uh, conceives of population growth as a purely uh, natural process and stipulates a so-called population law, uh, which assumes that population growth, uh, grows geometrically, that is, exponentially, so from 2 to 4 to 8 and so on, whereas foodstuff um, increases in a linear linear manner, one, two, three, four, five. And this, according to Malthus, entails that there will sooner or later be a shortage of food. And Malthus uses this to account for all sorts of crises, such as poverty, hunger, the formation of slums, and the social unrest in the uh, uh, British metropolises of his time. In order to um, avert the the threat of ever uh, greater population growth, Malthus propagated sexual abstinence, uh, late marriage, uh, investment in education as an instrument to lower uh, the birth rate, and he also propagated getting rid of welfare because he argued, Malthus argued, that the poor themselves are to blame if they're um, living above their means. So Malthus really uh, introduced the idea that we shouldn't get rid of poverty, but rather we should get rid of the poor. So um, Malthus assumed that population growth is, is a natural process, a sort of natural cycle, 
um, that brings with it um, the, the uh, ongoing immiseration of the population, and then the population is uh, reduced by war and, uh, and by immiseration and, and illness, diseases, and so on, and then the cycle begins anew. So there's, there's a great deal um, of elements of this discourse that um, we can still find in discourses today. Many people still consider population growth one of the key causes of social and ecological problems. And I have one quotation here that I brought with me. I said uh, earlier that I have a sense that in recent years there's been more talk about population growth as an um, issue within development debates. And here is a quotation from a book called Can Democracy Do Sustainability? Uh, it was um, published uh, or it involves contributions from the Wuppertal Institute on climate policy and other uh, similar institutes. And um, here in this quotation we have a comparison or an analogy between population growth and a, a, a person who is ill with cancer and still feeling well but expecting to be feeling worse soon. And so population growth is cons compared in this comparison to the growth of a cancer. So what does one do to prevent the spread of this cancer? Well, one engages in population control. Now, population control isn't understood to mean just lowering the birth rate, but more generally intervening in the generative, the procreative behavior of the population. There's an element of qualitative control that is inherent in that. I already spoke earlier to to uh, anti-natalist measures, measures that seek to reduce the birth rate. Now, the, there's a, a broad spectrum of policies that are employed to achieve such goals. Now, if we, if we look at um, one of these um, instruments that is used, it's education into the investment in the education of women and girls. But if we look further back into the past, there was a great deal of coercion involved. For example, in the 1980s in Bangladesh, women received money if they agreed to be sterilized. They were given enough money to feed their families for several weeks. Um, there was a widespread distribution of um, contraceptives. Uh, so uh, the problem was approached as if it were pr purely a problem concerning the availability of contraceptives and not a broader social problem. There's plenty of books, um, enough to fill entire libraries that were written on these issues. And one thing that we con continuously encounter in this literature uh, is uh, racist and sexist uh, overtones. That's not uh, so. Um, it's interesting to see that when these policies are implemented, it's indigenous women who are sterilized, often without their knowledge. It's female fetuses that are aborted. There's uh, coercive sterilization of handicapped people and many more such things. And the debate that we had in the 80s continued on into the 90s. But today we have a situation where when population control is called for in the context of uh, d discourses on sustainability, very few of the people calling for population control actually address these dark sides of the history of population control. One of the few people who does do this uh, and who has uh, is Martinez Allier who has uh, um, written about the problems that were associated with population control measures in the 1970s and he uh, wrote a, a text uh, about uh, uh, combining environmental justice with degrowth. What's interesting is that Allier, in his text, makes it clear or points out that there's a reversal of trends. If we go back uh, to this quotation, world population is uh, growth is completely out of hand. It's like the growth of a cancer. 
what's interesting is that what we have today is um, the United Nations, which is constantly publishing scenarios. We have reliable predictions that tell us that we're going to have a stabilization of population growth. That's the medium scenario, and if the uh, the um, if, uh, it's also possible that there will actually be a shrinking of the world population until the year 2300. <coughs> so obviously that's a prediction about a, um, a, about a period that's still centuries away, so there's a certain insecurity in it. In the year 2300, we may have only 2,3 billion people living on the planet. So just as population growth proceeds exponentially, population decreases also proceed exponentially. So they can also be very rapid. So in light of such predictions being published by the United Nations, it becomes clear that there's a very strong demagogical element to these other um, books that are being published on the issue of population growth. Now, in on the world at the World Population Conference in Cairo in 1994, uh, there was a text that was published that's quite surprising in that it equates 19th century neo Malthusianism with what today is described as reproductive rights. So the question that raises is are there feminist perspectives um, that are also neo Malthusian? This was a completely new idea to me. I, I asked myself whether there was something that I had overlooked, and I spoke to Christa Wichterich, who worked a great deal on this theme in the 1990s. And the idea behind all this is that, uh, and I'll be, I'll be ex explaining that in a moment. Uh, first, I want to speak to what reproductive rights actually means. Um, is that there is a logic here that, that persists, but I'll speak to that in a moment. Now, what is the concept of reproductive rights? It's uh, a concept that starts from the assumption that all couples and all individuals should be free to decide autonomously whether they will have children or not, how many children they will have, and so on, without any sort of violence, coercion, or discrimination involved. But, of course, this right is not per se antinatalist or um, oriented towards a a reduction of population growth. So why can one say that perhaps it's a Malthusian approach? Well, that's because it was in American feminists in particular who promoted the Cairo consensus. And there was what Susanna Schultz has called a kind of schizophrenia, where we have to distinguish very clearly between the macro and the micro level. Because on the micro level, um, women's health and self-determination were very much in the foreground. So we have a right to um, uh, contraceptives, we have a right to abortion, uh, and we also have a right to have children if we wish to do wish to have children. So all of that's been achieved on the individual level, but on the larger, the macro level, th there's still an emphasis on the need to reduce population growth, and it's there that feminist neo-Malthusian aspects may come into play. Um, now, beyond this concept, uh, one could say a great deal about this concept of reproductive rights. This would um, lead us too far astray. Um, so I, I want to uh, formulate just three more points that concern degrowth as seen from a feminist perspective. Now, apart from the coercive character of population control measures in the past and the violations of human rights, um, we're also dealing here with an unjustified reduction of the complexity of the global challenge. What do I mean by that? In most debates on post-growth and sustainability, there's a very sophisticated analysis of the causal background to these problems we're facing. And then all of a sudden, uh, um, the, the, the solution is articulated in terms not of a, in, in, the, the population control is, is presented as a solution to these complex problems. So there's a sudden simplification of the problem insofar as to focus in this way on population control is to lose sight of social problems. Of course, every human being who is alive consumes natural resources. That's a banal point. But we're not dealing with problems that can be solved by a simple calculus. Uh, it's not a purely m mathematical issue of how many people there are and how many resources are available for them. Um, 
this whole argument is based on a no on the notion of average the a average human being there's no recognition that we have hierarchies and 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 uh, an imperial lifestyle and uh, differences in the way that uh, people across the globe um, make use of or relate to nature there's no attention that's paid to um, gender issues and also uh, there is uh, and this is also striking about this debate so the, uh, the same sort of rationality that is uh, there, that, or there's a rationality that is applied to the regulation of natural resources and to the regulation of human beings. So there's a, a technocratic idea of how um, society and human beings should be controlled and uh, and uh, regulated. There's the assumption that nature and human beings can be quantified economically, such that. Uh, CO2, CO2 emissions and population growth can be calculated, their effects can be calculated, they can become part of a calculus. This is something I think is highly problematic because uh, the, behind it is, is the idea that um, re natural resources, waste products that are produced when these resources are consumed and human beings are all put on the same level and, and that's something I think is very problematic. And of course what's also very important is that I don't want to negate the challenges that, for example, the expansion of cities involves. Of course, if we were going to have further population growth, that is going to be a catalyst that will um, intensify certain crises. But as um, Katja Hummel has said, it's not the changes in population that are the problem in and of themselves, because we also have a problem when population is reduced. Um, so we have a problem with, for example, the sewage system when it's um, and the water system, the water supply system when it's not utilized sufficiently and not utilized enough. So it's a question of how society adjusts to demographic changes. We have to ask ourselves what sorts of um, resource systems do we need to do justice to a, a society that is expanding or contracting demographically and we need to be wary of um, of forgetting that we're dealing here with uh, social conflicts over issues of distribution and this is in the last and the final point I, I want to make t is that uh, that this call for educate the education of women and girls is of course a, a call that no one uh, here would um, would would reject but uh, the point is that education for women and girls is a value in and of itself and it mustn't be linked to demographic issues it's the link between the two that is established that I think is problematic so what follows from all this well I think we need a change of perspective of the kind that feminist theory is also called for in other areas as Bea pointed out earlier it's no longer a, a matter of, of how many people the earth can sustain or a certain region can sustain we need rather to think about how much imperial lifestyle um, the earth and a certain re and certain regions of the earth can sustain and if we then uh, think about what um, sustainability um, social and ecological sustainability might look like then um, we're led to the question of what the good life might be and that of course is a point where we can link up with all sorts of other debates at this conference thank you yeah,